Um, which is, um, now I meant to check before I got to this point in the introduction, I think we're now into the fourth year of the Lit Fest. Um, fifth. fifth. It, yes, yes. I mean, the last year has been a long one, hasn't it? Um, and, and we've gone online, of course, um, in, in order to, to keep people safe, but to keep the Lit Fest going. So thank you all for turning up and for contributing to the coffers, because... Um, Without you keeping coming, there will not be a lit fest. And, you know, we, we hope we will be back in person next year. Um, so for the purposes of this evening, um, I want you to start um, imagining that we're all gathered around the campfire um, with that wonderful wood smoke smell, um, if you can picture that. Um, and the, the last of the evening birds are just sort of calling before it gets completely dark. So the, the focus of this evening is, is going to be Sam's wonderful book, The Nightingale. Um, what can I tell you about Sam Lee? Um, he's a, a singer, storyteller, a musician, founder of The Next Collective, a conservationist and a nightingale aficionado. And I've got a much longer list than that, but I'll, I'll stop at the, the nightingale. Um, anything you could want to know about nightingales um, is in this book. Um, but more than that, for me, it captures that kind of magical feeling of being in the presence of this wonderful bird. Um, in the introduction, Sam rather modestly says it's not a definitive book. Um, it's not even a brush with the wings of the bird. Um, for its world is huge, but actually, if you if you if you haven't already bought the book, please do and um, and broach its pages. Um, and the other thing that I took from the book, um, as well as the magic of the nightingales, there's there's a warning note sounding throughout the book about how endangered the nightingale is, which I hadn't realised before I started reading it. Uh, you know, with its habitats at risk both here where it spends the summers and in West Africa where it spends the winters. So there's, I'm sure going to be lots for you to learn this evening from Sam. Um, and I hope it'll, it'll whet your appetite for going out into the woods and finding nightingales. And a little, in a little while, we'll, we'll post links to um, where you can buy the book and to the Nest Collective who run um, uh, sessions um, singing with nightingales um, starting next April and I will now hand you over to Sam. Thank you Caroline and thank you John and Dave as well for having me. Thank you all of you for coming, turning up. Um, it's funny it's been a while since I've done a Zoom uh, one like this. It seems to be not long ago that this was how the sharings happened and <laughs> now I find myself back in rooms with my band and playing concerts and at real gatherings it's um I forget actually how much I enjoy zooms I get to be in my home and I get I, I feel like there's a much greater intimacy <laughs> than, the, than some of those sort of plastic marquees you find yourselves in no offense if the uh the Milton Keynes festival has marquees usually but um <laughs> I don't get to sit in my own seat in them so um yeah, it's uh, the other interesting thing about this is speaking about the bird, the nightingale, um, at a time where I couldn't feel more distant from him. Um, and that's because right now, our nightingales that I spent the spring with this year, uh, some of which I'd known from the year before, and some of which I'd known from the year before that, others were, were born this year and raised and fledged and migrated are all now in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, where I'd much rather be <laughs> in the heat, um, in the forests there, the rupine forests in the scrubs, um, in Senegal and Sierra Leone, um, and knocking around there, jumping from, from country to country, living a very different life. And in some ways I feel very estranged from them, um, as opposed to, the springtime where my affinity is with them in a very English pastoral sense right now they're tropical um, and they are singing they do sing when they're in uh, their African wintering grounds 
but I feel that they are a, they're in their own speaking a different language and are foreign beings to me. So it's um it's very interesting kind of trying to recall that relationship that was so inten intensely had with the birds. And when I say intensely had, we're thinking, well, what on earth does he do? And I just I must ask, how many of you here have ever joined me? I'm assu I'm sure one or two of you. I see there, yeah, Julie and Angela. I thought I recognised you. You've been out into the woods with me to hear them. Um, maybe Rob, have you? I can't remember Rob. Have you been down as well? Yes. Um, so a few of you know that uh, between the, the 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 day of the fourteenth of April, they can almost time it the day that they were very early this year. Um, uh, very thoughtlessly of them because it ended up being the worst spring possible. But uh, they arrive around the 12th, 13th, 14th of April. And from about that time, I pretty much live in the woods with them till about the end of May, beginning of June, when they when the males stop singing their courtship song. And it's over that period when they just arrive, that there's this amazing opportunity to, to have this very splendid, very intimate and sonic experience with the birds, spending the night with them and I become nocturnal. Well, I kind of become like them. I become both a night being and a day being because they sing throughout the night. The males sing throughout the night as part of their courtship song, uh, trying to trying to attract the females. And it's this song that's made them so famous in culture and uh, folklore and mythology. And it's really that that I'm, that time, that time of night that I'm seeking out to enter into this uh, unusual dialogue where you get to be in really, really close proximity to the birds because at that time the males are totally fearless and you can be, you know, two meters away from one in the dark, lying there with the, uh, with the, with the birds singing away at very, very loud volume. And I mean, it's like being next to the speaker in, in the concert hall. They are exceptionally loud and no matter what so song I sing or instrument I bring with me, they will carry on and indeed collaborate in with musicians. And this is a such a phenomenal experience that I find myself quite obsessed and there with audiences. And on the nights when I'm not with audiences, just going down on my own to be in, in the presence of what I consider to be one of the finest singers in the whole world giving a concert like no other concert in one of the most beautiful auditoriums one can imagine under the springtime stars as the leaves are starting to appear on the trees and the moon is waxing or waning in, in that sort of electric time of year where you can feel the rush of energy and sap rising. It's a, it's a deeply romantic place in the dark. Um, and to be there in the presence of this solo singer not the cacophony of an evening or dawn chorus or the general kind of banter of birds, but actually to be in the in this singular solo song of uh, the majestic nightingale is such a phenomenal thing. Nobody who I've ever brought has kind of ever experienced anything like it. And we're very lucky really in England that we still have these birds in such a tiny population compared to the hundreds of thousands um, still returning still giving this timeless concert um that has inspired so many human beings and uh artists and writers and musicians for thousands of years more than just thousands of years for tens for hundreds of thousands of years because as you know that you know we've we as a species are relatively you know appeared as a blink of an eye in the trajectory of of um evolution you know, it was only uh, two, three hundred years ago that we were a very, very different being with very different shaped heads with intellectual capacities. And we've evolved exceptionally fast into where we are now on Zoom, um, lying on our, you know, synthetic fibred couches and, you know, under artificial light. It's amazing what we've done. The nightingale has probably not changed in millions of years, maybe slight adaptation of song and plumage and maybe little scalings up of size according to habitat and you know we don't really know actually this is a much of this is trajectory but we know is that there has been night birds singing for throughout the entire evolution of our species and because the nightingale 
loves the habitat that is created by humans from from 400,000 years ago when we were first wielding fire and sculpting the landscape and creating grasslands and scrub um, and the sorts of landscape that we might see now today in places like Nepri Wilding Estate or Eastern European uh, prim primeval meadowlands and the, the kind of past pastoral um, landscapes that of the, the primitive pastoral landscapes that are still existing just in little patches in Poland and Romania, which I know probably best of all, and um, Bulgaria and Croatia and Eastern Europe. You know, that landscape is stuffed full of nightingales. They're prolific, they're singing away all spring and much of the early summer. And um, that was the environment that we as a human species helped create. So as we've evolved and gained our technology and our, uh, and our ability to affect and sculpt the landscape, the nightingales have been singing through the finest times of year when the fat of the land was returning and the, the green and, and the edibility and after the cold long winters, um, the nightingales would have been a song that our ancient early ancestors would have been so familiar with and not just familiar but calmed and soothed and utterly enchanted by. Uh, they would have been the harbingers of spring because they would have returned from Africa to let us know that spring is on its way, even when it's still frosty and cold and, and leafless, the nightingales would have been there and be that explosion of sound and energy and excitement, almost as though their song itself is drawing the sap up the, uh, the stems and the, 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 the trunks and the branches of the trees. So that impact on us uh, in our ancient societies is irrefutable. And in a times where we were developing a musicality, a language, those two things combined, uh, an articulation of our, and an imagination towards the way the world is and how we can, uh, af yeah, affect uh, positive occurrences and to help us survive the nightingales would have been singing and inspiring and no doubt um, challenging us to learn musicality. Um, so they've had for hundreds of thousands of years a profound effect on our ancestors. Um, and that would have uh, continued into as language developed into our mythology, into our storytelling, into our religion. And the evidence of that is that across the Northern Hemisphere, from as far east as Western Mongolia, and as far west as uh, Eastern Devon, um, we have this uh, nightingale that features in all the languages and all the folk songs and all the old stories and the mythologies of the communities and cultures, the traditional uh, existence of the communities and cultures that are still around today, or we have evidence of going back in the last 2000 years, which is relatively small time period. So nightingales are there everywhere, named, spoken, sung about, and there is no other bird that has such a ubiquitous and kind of, how shall I say, such a principal presence in uh, each of those countries that holds its presence as being so much more powerful and important than any other bird. Um, they are the, they have such a, a strong role that um, it, it illustrates what a powerful creature they have and how they've sat in our lives and our neighbors' lives, neighboring communities' lives. Um, and so I find that quite incredible that first it's quite incredible that there hasn't been somebody who's gone out and gathered as much of the literature and and instances of the nightingale in all these different uh places and uh recordings and documents and brought them together because they tell an extraordinary story of a species that not only connects you know us english people i'm assuming we're all based in england right now with our 
distant Mongolian step far out cousins who throat sing and milk milk kind of yaks and <laughs> live in yurts. We all listen to this same bird and go, ah, oh, the nightingale. And that's kind of rather amazing to think that we have that in common. Likewise, the bird also connects us to our sub-Saharan uh, distant relatives, um, you know, and communities who are living in a very, very different way of life um, and unconnected to us by hundreds of thousands of years, yet um, receive this bird for half or six months of the year, listen to his song. Um, and I say the his because it is only the males that sing. Um, and we share this amazing creature that defies boundaries, defines borderlines between, uh, yeah, between states and uh, legal and language barriers that we have created or imposed um, around the world. They freely uh, transgress and go where they like to where they think is right for them to be, to their nascent land, which is the UK. They are born here, they come here to mate and to, to breed. And, um, and yet somehow those youngsters know where to go back to sub-Saharan Africa. And they make that journey unguided, not in flocks, but solo all the way down through France, Spain, um, Southern Spain, over the Straits of Gibraltar into North Africa and around the West Coast as our nightingales do. Some nightingales from Europe will travel across the Sahara or go round through Israel and the Middle East and down through East Africa. So they do this extraordinary journey and they're only tiny little birds, little brown creatures with very small amounts of color variation, you know, just, just shades of brown and a little bit of russet on the tail and a whiter bleaching on the chest. But one of the simplest looking birds and only about the size of a robin. So they are, you know, they, their, their capability is in their um, is in their voice and in the dexterity of their singing voice. For size compared to volume, they're one of the loudest birds in the bird world. Not the loudest bird. I think the wren actually outwits the nightingale because they're so much smaller. But you can hear a nightingale on a cool and um, damp night when the sonic conduction is much stronger. You can hear a nightingale at almost a mile away. Uh, when they're singing in the quiet of night. It's quite phenomenal. So when you're up close to them, your ears are throbbing in the volume. It's quite magnificent. And they have within them the ability to sing, I think around 250 different phrases and about 1500 different sounds. And they improvise on them, cycling through these different um, phrases never repeating, often coming back to particular leap motifs and phrases that you'll go, ah, oh, yes, that nightingale, that one, I, I know that bit of song. I recognize him, he came here last year. And you'll become familiar with the, with the voice of each individual bird. Um, but they will never repeat the same combination. So you'll have the song, 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 phrase, 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 and then silence, and then Song, 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 phrase, phrase, different declaration and then silence. And it's always this incredible on and off as they sing and then they go into this place of listening, of receiving the responses from other males. They're very collaborative with the other males and also listening out just to see what's, what's there. Um, and they'll sing from about 10.30 at night from the beginning of the season all the way through to dawn, five, six, and they'll There'll be this incredible moment where the nightingale, the dawn chorus will come in to join in with the nightingales. And they're very collaborative. They're very playful. So if a wren starts singing or a robin, they'll really give room for those birds and allow them to sing and never interfere. And then the dawn chorus gets to its kind of absolute peak. And then the nightingale is like, OK, that's me done for the night. <laughs> I'm going to go and have a rest, hand it over to the day, the day watch. Um, but then they'll sing throughout the day as well. A much less eloquent and uh, not quite as uh, 
not not on a song with as much bravado, but they will sing during the day. You can hear them in the day, uh, but it's not as constant. It's not got that absolute consistent, uh, yeah, just, yeah, it, inventiveness of the night. Um, I realize I'm doing, you know, how is everyone? I'm talking and talking at you. Is everyone all right? Do you mind? Just wave. You can do the old kind of if things are okay. Good. If you want to ask me questions, oh look, there's a chat box here. I should probably I put you full screen so I I can't see this. Uh uh, oh look, it's just lots of promotion. Our work is critical. Yes, okay. I should be looking at the chat box to see if you've got any questions. I'm very happy for you to ask me questions. Uh and um, yeah, just put them in the chat box. That would be great. Um, yeah, shall I sing you a song? Shall I sing you a Nightingale song? Um, I'll sing this one. This is my favorite and I haven't sung it for so long and it's such the wrong time of year to sing this because it's called Birds in the Spring. And all I've got is robins and great tits singing right now and the parakeets. It's the only bird song I get to hear right now. So this is for the cuckoos and the skylarks and the, the turtle doves and all those beautiful birds that have, most of which have gone quiet. Actually, the skylarks might still be going. Mm. This is one of the Sussex nightingale anthems from the Copper family who live not that many miles from where I go and hear the nightingales and, and do the concerts with them. Mm. One May morning early, I chance for to roll. As I walk through those valleys, by the side of a grove. It is there I did hear those charming birds sing. Did you ever hear so sweet? Did you ever hear so sweet? Did you ever hear so sweet as the birds in the spring? As I sat myself down to view all around and the song of the nightingale why he echoed all around his notes were so charming his voice so sincere no music no song no music, no songster. No music, no songster can with him compare. So all of you here them small birds do hear. I'll have you pay attention. Now listen, draw near. That when you grow old, you'll have this to say. That we never heard so sweet. That we never heard so sweet. That you've never heard so sweet as the birds in the spring. Hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> the silent clap. 
Ah, so some questions here. Uh, I'll take, I'll just read a few of them out. Where did you hear your first nightingale from Angela? And what age were you when you heard that first nightingale from Caroline? Um, and during the first lockdown, a nightingale came to a scrubby field near me for the first time, says Julia Lane privately. I hope you don't mind, uh, Julia. Uh, I used to go up and listen to him regularly and he literally got me through that strange time. Oh my God, the healer, the, uh, the medicine bird, great. Nothing beats the clarity and beauty of a nightingale song. No, I try, Julia, to beat the beauty of a nightingale song, but I never come close. Um, I was 20, maybe 26 or 27 when I first heard a nightingale, knowingly. Um, I was taken to hear one. Um, and it was an extraordinary moment and an extraordinary moment for reasons that I won't say now, because actually it's quite emotional. I mean, it was emotional just hearing one. I was not prepared. Um, but the circumstances that followed uh, were quite life changing for me and actually deeply tragic. Um, it's it's in the introduction to the book and I go into to tell that story. And I uh, it's not one I'm going to go into right now because it'll open me up. Um, uh, but it's a terribly beautiful one. Um, it was uh, Ardingly Reservoir in Sussex. Um, I remember it well, though there's something about the, the being with a nightingale in the night that creates a sort of amnesia. So I'm never quite sure how much I remember and how much of that memory I have created. Um, it's something that happens when I go back and think about the many nights I've spent and God, I can remember so many of them. Um, and we're talking at least, you know, 40 nights a year, I'm out there with them, but every night is different. So, um, so yeah, um, question for Sam from John. Nightingales are so widespread and affect so many different cultures. Do different cultures perceive them differently? And is their perception always friendly and supportive? No, not at all. They're, the nightingale holds all sorts of characters in folklore. Sometimes it's a, an annoying bird. I mean, there's been so many instances. In fact, um, there's, there's stories that have come over to this country. And there are different people who claim uh, that Thomas a. Beckett, I think, amongst others, was accused of being of ordering the, the, dis, the destruction of all the nightingales gales in Kent because they kept him awake at night. And you have many stories about these pestilent birds keeping the farmers and villagers awake all night. Um, but at the same time, they're also treated with great affection and romance and uh, multiple personalities of the bird. And my interpretation, I, I, I can't go into detail of each country and what what, you know how because it varies from what records are left uh the english certainly i will say have turned the bird often into a very kind of um uh promiscuous creature that's there associated with clandestine romantic you know sort of uh escapades and and young lovers quite kind of illicitly um caught, courting one another uh also a bird that um, holds a place of great nostalgia, of thinking back to the spring and the, the a time of pleasure and romance and how uh, the bird is associated so much with that time of year. Um, but what I often think is, is that the bird is as much a, a reflection of the cultures around it, around him or her. And, um, and that's what I find so interesting is how it might reveal a lot more about the culture than the bird themselves. The birds have their own personalities and it's very difficult to judge them with human traits. Um, yeah. Can they mimic other birds? Yes, they do. So nightingales are uh, like many of the birds, song thrushes and blackbirds uh, acquire their repertoire as they grow older. 
And you certainly can hear within nightingales when there's a nightingale that's living very close to a song thrush and has absorbed some of the song thrush sounds. And likewise, you hear song thrushes that are grow live near nightingales. And um, it's always amazing when that happens because you get them uh, kind of copying each other's song. That mimicry is something that happens across the bird world and um, is, yeah, is uh, you know really quite splendid. Uh, nightingales also learn off each other, most importantly, uh, and they'll, they'll increase their repertoire and they'll have their own unique way of singing and stances on familiar sounds. They're very, there's a very evolved song. Um, yeah. Thank you for those questions. Um, I want to read a bit of the book to you as well. Um, and I should probably praise you this. This is a book, this is a, 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 a section of the book that actually comes right at the end, which is about the kind of hopes for the future. And, and the hopes for the future being that we're in dire straits with our nightingales. We're in dire straits with many of our birds. They're declining at an enormous rate of about 85% a year, we expect. Um, so a shrinking population. They, like the turtle dove and, and the cuckoo, are expected to be extinct in our country within the next 30 to 40 years. The turtle dove's first bird, we think, will go extinct at the rate of decline. Um, and there are so many reasons for that due to uh, man-made issues, habitat loss, the impact of deer, the impact of pesticides, so many things. Also, most significantly, change in landscape in sub-Saharan Africa. They're not surviving the journey back. But also, I think of the nightingale in many ways, like the, the canary in the mine, that when what we can see in the loss of the nightingale is, is happening across all our species in this country. We received the report today about the decline in butterflies that are also the litmus test, uh, the kind of barometer of the health of the land. We have a massive decline in butterflies this year, partly because of the wet weather early in the spring, but also because of pesticide use. And um, there's so much we can do. You know, the simple act of eating organic food for starters it is a little bit more expensive. But if we eat organic, what we're really doing is funding a farmer to not use pesticides. So another field and the amount of food you eat in a year, if you think of the land it takes, all that land is thus an organic patch of land. I think that's a very profound uh, impact that we can have. And likewise, by, uh, by farming organic, you're often supporting a farmer who has a slightly more nature-friendly way of thinking if they're that way inclined. So that's a very powerful one. Uh, there are many things we can do, but for me, the, the thing that I do that I feel is most important is about, is about finding ways and opportunities to love nature, to bring nature into our lives as much as possible and dare ourselves out, dare I, dare I say, of the comfort of our homes, particularly in springtime. And it's so magical. And to step into that domain, not just for nightingales, you might not have them living near you, but um, to really, uh, to bring nature into your life and to work on one's own familiarity, but also to invite people. Um, I do this by running my Singing with Nightingales concerts where people come and sit around the fire with me and we eat and drink and I tell stories and sing songs. And then we go to the Nightingales after dark. And that's my way of brokering a uh, as, 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 and being a steward for that relationship, because sometimes it can be quite a terrifying thing, you know, especially for women to be going into the dark at night. This is a privilege that I have both being male, being adventurous and stable in my feet and having a car and affording petrol and knowing where to go. These are all things that set me up as a very, very uh, small percentage of uh, uh, yeah, within the population who has that ability. Um, and it's a domain that is there for us to go and love. And I think that for me, the most tragic thing is that the nightingale wouldn't just go extinct, but nobody would notice them going extinct. So I want to read this um, part of the book, which is called 
uh, a vision of one day. Um, I have to find it somewhere here. And it it's a sort of invitation, I guess, um, an invitation to for you all to kind of do what I do in whatever way you want to do. But it's a sort of fantasy scenario of how we as a society might have a relationship with nature. Because in the UK, and I say specifically the UK, Great Britain and Ireland, unlike Europe, we have a really, really destroyed relationship with nature. Now, that might not be the case for you guys. You're probably the, the lucky few who are here because you are already in, in the know and have a nightingale in, in, on the lane near you and have that ability and practice it. But we don't have a practice in this country. It's been destroyed through hundreds of years of land ownership, of enclosures, of rule, rules of trespass, of separation and segregation from our, uh, from our natural heritage. Uh, it's a very unique one for Great Britain. Uh, we inherited it over to the United States in their sense of permission, you know, the fear of trespassing uh, that we have installed within us. Whereas you go to Scandinavia, you can go to Scotland, it's very different, they have right to roam there. Scandinavia, Europe, there's a much more permissive attitude towards being in nature. And because of that, there's been an inheritance down the generations of people not going, oh, we mustn't go there. Oh, we must stick to the path. Oh, there's a fence saying trespass keep out. We mustn't go there to a, uh, a, a, an inheritance of let's go picking mushrooms. Let's go and listen to the nightingale sim. Let's sing, let's go swimming in rivers. This is what we do as a family. Always have done, why would we do any different? We don't have that in this country. Very few families do. And we have a real job in turning that around. And there's some wonderful campaigns going on right now that are, um, are challenging that attitude. And for me, the nightingales are a wonderful way of uh, sort of walking all over those boundaries that we have, those mental boundaries, partly because you do it at night. And when it's nighttime, that idea of curtilage, that idea of that's owned by that person, that's owned by that person, doesn't seem to exist anymore. Suddenly it's the fox's land or it's the owl's land, it's the nightingale's land. How can this, how can at night it be owned by a human being? What human being would be out here to claim their ownership? So there's a wonderful uh, topsy-turviness to the night, which is a great time thus to reclaim our our sense of co communal ownership. A vision of a one day. I've long dreamt there to be one utterly fanciful and romantic way that this call to bond further with nature and nightingales and all their legacy of appreciation might take hold amongst friendship groups and families. I like to imagine that one day in a not too distant future, a ritual will exist annually every spring. England having as many nightingales as it did before the 1960s, that is in the hundreds of thousands. Experiences come early May, an exodus of people from their homes to go and do a nightingale. Families and friends, couples and singletons, grandparents and grandchildren, community groups, work colleagues, whoever it pleases, will gather on gentle dry nights with flasks of hot tea, snacks, maybe even a bottle of port or whiskey, blankets, and at around 9 p.m. will leave their homes or the pub or drive many hundreds of miles even to head out to a nightingale hotspot. On the journey, stories will be told of when each person first heard his song and how wonderful it will be to hear this bird again after a long cold winter how much the spring has come on this year, how early or late it was, and other such seasonal reminiscences and observations. When the destination is reached, a silence will fall upon the group, like when the lights go down at a concert and a hush will reign. Intrepid steps are made into the brush to get close to a bird as quietly as possible. And when he is reached, blankets are spread, and everyone cozes up to one another to start listening. 
I imagine this scene like an English equivalent of a Burns night, but informally arranged on the leafy floor amongst the hyacinthine scent of bluebells. There are kids curled up on parents' laps, friends resting their heads on each other's bellies or leaning back to back. After a while of just listening to the nightingale sing, out of someone's pocket comes an old tattered notebook with scraps of paper. Maybe it's been handed down from a late parent or gifted from a godmother when they were young. A phone light is discreetly turned on and in hushed reverential voices, poems and songs and rounds and prose are recited or sung up towards our nightingale. Every offering is an heirloom received, found or chosen along life's way, savoured as being perfect for this annual moment. The opportunity to share something is passed around for everyone who wants to give a sonnet or a recitation. An improvised sharing evolves, unique to those present and to each year's mood. Some sharings are somber and mournful. Others are comical with muted sniggers and irreverences. Some people are formal, others are casual. Some are drunk, others are stoned. Some are erotic, some are lonely. Some are romantic, some are in remembrance, and some are in prayer. But all are in celebration of this bird and of ourselves as sentient, sensitive beings, grateful for what might not have survived. As the night ends and we drowsily make our way home, drunk on nightingale song and a bit woozy, I like to think that the resounding feeling that everyone goes home with, exclaiming to one another, is not as I hear all the time today, gosh, why don't we do this more often, but more of a, wow, thank you everyone. I'm so pleased we do this every year. Call me romantic and I've been called worse, but is this not the sort of restorative practice that could epitomize an idiosyncratic English escapade and be the most perfect way to gather for a night each spring? similar to the way European families go off on a day of foraging for fungi in autumn. This ritual, picking up from where May Day ceases to hold prominence or even relevance in our communities today, would be a baptism of each year's arrival of spring. Hmm. Um, so that's my kind of that's my fantasy of, you know, when we say, what would we like the future to look like in 50 years? How would you like, you know, how would you like the world to be? And I, I kind of like this idea that an act like that existed, uninitiated. I didn't have to take people out into the woods. People just did it of their own accord. And they phoned up friends and they, yeah, they, they made the, the pledge to go and do it. Um, I feel like the act of ritual is very important. It's, you know, it's been part of our ancient existence and still is very part of lots of people's lives and particularly our indigenous communities that are still present today, uh, tribal families living close to the land, that that act of noting when things, cycles come into their moment, into season, uh, of paying the sort of respect. And these gestures I think have a very powerful effect the work I do with the Sing with Nightingales of going into this space of sitting with that nightingale as I've described so intimately is like going into a trance. I know those who've been will know you don't come out the same person. <laughs> you know, it's, it's transformative and I'm transformed by it every time I do it. And I can't believe how often I come out feeling like a different person coming into such uh, amazing um kind of confrontation with my own soul, with my own ideas and imaginations and fears. I confront my own, uh, my own fears and my own vulnerabilities. And I think that's a great privilege to have a space like that, that isn't a therapist. You know, it, it isn't, you know, it, it, it's nature doing nature's healing work. And we've grown up, you know, all our existences uh, in accordance to that, so deeply connected. We are the same bodies as 10,000 years ago. The people who painted Lascaux and Chauvet Cave, you know, it's often said that their physiology 
their minds, their brains, their eyes, their ears, they're no different to us. If we've been accidentally born or, you know, adopted by one of those communities, we'd be as capable and, and, and present and alert and, uh, you know, energetic as those people. We are simply a victim of our lifestyle or, or a, a consequence, shall I say, not a victim, a consequence of our lifestyle, which is great because we live for much longer years. Uh, but we also miss out on quite a lot. Nature is the teacher. And I go there to, to, to remind myself and to impart to others what the importance of deep listening, being more like a nightingale, being songful, being spirited, being sensitive, uh, doing as much singing as I do listening. Um, so important of how much within the personality of the nightingale, I have learned about who I am as a human being, how much I've yeah been sort of sculpted by that bird and that's just the nightingale and then you take the turtle dove where i lead pilgrimages with um another you know uh, species or trees that i've spent so much time with that i've started to learn about their personality and their qualities and how much that has allowed me to start feeling i'm going to be more beech tree today <laughs> i'm going to I'm going to be a willow in this situation. I'm going to weep. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And, and actually, nature holds so many qualities of ourselves in such beautiful ways and majestic ways and, and, and mature ways that um, there's a lot to learn. So um, here I, um, I go on, and I don't know how I'm doing for time. Um, Another question for me, can we, the UK on our own, assure the nightingale thrives? Are we, necess uh, are we necessary, but not sufficient? What else does the nightingale need to get back to ten hundreds of thousands? Do they need more than reverence? Well, of course, but of course they need more than reverence. But without reverence, without falling in love with the nightingale, people won't start, without changing our hearts about the nightingale, we won't change our minds. And our minds are what needed to be changed nationally to really bring about a determined uh, reformation of our relationship and exploitation of nature. There's two sides to this story. There's of course the great hope that we can, um, we can do an amazing thing of turning around our stewardship of our landscape, reinvestment in the land, getting away with intensive agriculture, looking at more nature-friendly ways of farming uh, and ways that we can feed ourselves that both uh, create a greener, greener economy, more jobs for people. It's all about investment, you know. If we invested into the green economy as much as we invested into dairy farms and, you know, and, and pig farms, it's like, and poultry that are poison to the landscape. You look at the amazing work of the River Y explorations from George Monbiot and his team, at the death of the River Wye, the, the river that I grew up on, I remember fishing in, catching trout in and swimming in and crayfish, now lifeless in many parts because of the poultry farms. Every time we buy supermarket chicken, we're eating meat that is been grown entirely off soya beans from the Amazon, cut Amazon rainforest, and the effluent of which is being sent straight into the river systems. It's just unbelievable what the impact of our actions are. And that's just it. I think one of the best slogans I ever heard in environmentalism is just make better choices. <laughs> just do the good thing. Don't be so damn lazy. And I say this to myself because I eat crap food too. I'm not a vegetarian. I'm not perfect. I need reminding and calling up on these things. So we could do something incredible. We could allow you know, the nightingale population to bit by bit grow and grow and grow. Um, it can be done. And if it doesn't happen to nightingales, it'll happen to other birds, their populations will grow. So it's a, it's a positive thing, whatever happens, if we do create a sort of habitat the nightingales live in, allow the messiness, the scrub. If you own land, allowing it, a portion of it to return to nature. There's so many things we can do. The reality is that, you know, in, less than a month now we are going to go into cop 26 um, the big climate talks the crucial ones that people are seeing as the sort of the breaking point for humanity 
And by all expectations, it's going to be an absolute failure. Most of the countries who need protecting first and foremost won't, can't afford to even be there. And we're going to find ourselves with no real legitimate um, accountability to maintaining uh, temperature rises below 1.5 degrees. And with runaway climate change, what we're looking at is scorched earth. And so, you know, no hope for nightingales there. No hope for us, any of us, really. Um, so the inevitability is that uh, I think we've got to work really hard at doing the work of um, bringing those who are alive and will be alive to hear nightingales into the presence of nightingales and the rest of the natural world because what we have and will have left once it is all gone is our stories and our songs and that is something that we as through all the epochs of crisis and extermination and extinction that's what we've carried through with us and that's what we as a species are beautiful and brilliant at doing is making art and remembering the things that don't no longer exist the walls of Chauvet and Lascaux pay testament to extinct species. This is not the first time. They sang and made art about the aurochs and the, and the bison and the saber-toothed cats and the cave bears and species that haven't been around for thousands of years. Um, we should do the same about nightingales and turtle doves and cuckoos, etc. So a, a sort of a tragic, <laughs> doom laden sort of finale that's the reality but i think in that the, the the imparting the hope to rejoice and celebrate because that's what we need to do and i always say to beat the opposition and fight the good fight you have to throw a better party party um and so make sure we fill our lives up with rejoicement and celebration um Otherwise, <laughs> yeah, otherwise. <laughs> um, I feel like that might be a, a nice place to end. I don't know if that is my time. Yeah, it's half past nine. Wow, I've gone for a whole hour. Mm -hmm. Felt like 25 minutes to me. Um, thank you very much. I, I, I have this book. Um, please do get a copy if you haven't already. Um, there's an audio book as well, which I had the great pleasure of reading out. Um, I should say also that um, I'm going on tour with my band, singing lots of the songs about my love of nature, the old folk songs. Um, and Milton Keynes, probably the nearest place might be, um, don't know, Colchester? How close is Milton Keynes to Colchester? Not very close. Uh, Caution, Bristol, London Union Chapel, I guess, the big one uh, on the 11th of November. I'd love you to come. And you've seen the links above. If you want to come into the woods with me in spring for Sing with Nightingales, uh, tickets were released uh, last week, 28th of September, we released tickets for 2022 and half of them have sold out already. <laughs> so get your tickets quickly because they're going to go. And we can only do 30 people a night. It's an intimate experience, as intimate as this. And we'd love to see you guys there and bring someone special who you think would uh, receive something if you do come. Oh, and I have, thank you. And I have an album that came out a few weeks ago. <laughs> no, last week. Well, it was a reissue. Old Wow uh, is the, um, my, my album uh, with lots of, with some Nightingale songs on it. So some of the recordings I made in the woods with the nightingales are on there so you can get that all online and or come and yeah see me thank you sorry that's an awful commercial end buy more stuff that's what you have to do no don't buy any of it <laughs> um Thank, Thank you very you. much, Sam. I don't know if people would like to sort of unmute themselves, yeah, and say say goodbye as they leave. Um, it's been um, it's been lovely, and um, I, I expect before long every single singing with nightingales will be sold out. And now I'm going to rush <laughs> over to Nest Club and put my ticket for next year. So thank you very much, Sam. Thank you all. Really yeah. appreciate that. Um, yeah, thanks for having me.
Yeah. Ah, you, an absolute yes. pleasure. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Sam. Thanks. See you playing Thank Birmingham. You. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Should we do a, a Should we do a collective? Five, four, three, two, one, leave. <laughs> it's not that awkward. Fingers on button. <laughs> and, and we all say good night. 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 Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Caroline, Dave, and John, for having us. Thank you. Absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>